Well, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome to today's webinar, Strategies for Navigating Toxic or Misaligned Leadership. Woo, that's a mouthful. <laughs> so come on in. Let's take a minute while everybody is coming in to say hello. Let's see where you're all coming in from. We've got New York City, Ohio, Tennessee, Alberta. Yes, let us know where you're chiming in from. Well, I am super excited about today's webinar. This topic has been a work in progress for months. <laughs> Kayla and I started this journey. Oh my gosh, I don't know, Kayla, in the spring, I think, and maybe early spring. And we have had many conversations about this project, which I want to tell you about the project and how this came together and how we actually Kayla is the one who honed in on this very important, critical topic. So I'm honored that she is here today with us. Um, Kayla is not a stranger to office dynamics and maybe not a stranger to some of you. She just presented at our conference and she has presented at other webinars with us. So first of all, though, let's just go through some webinar logistics in case this is your first time. We will have about 40 minutes uh, for the educational portion. And again, Kayla, this is more of what I call an Oprah style webinar meaning it's not like this heavy script that we're going through it's more of a dialogue and i will prompt kayla with questions and she's going to take it from there so uh, that's the style that we're going to use today please place your questions in the chat we definitely want to hear your questions today um, around this topic and I'm sure you're going to think of some after you hear Kayla delve into the difference between a toxic leader and misalignment. They're two different things. So we're going to do that. And then we do have a special offer today um, because as a result of all this information, we published this fantastic guide that um, Kayla wrote that she put together, and I'm going to tell you that little story in a moment, and you will get a replay link. So I think that's it for our logistics. Let me introduce Kayla first of all, in case some of you don't know about Kayla or the, the more formal side of the introduction. Kayla Hutchins is an executive assistant with multiple certifications with two decades of experience providing excellent, and I can vouch for that, uh, administrative support to all levels of managers and executives. She is currently the executive assistant for, I don't think it's UES. Oh. Where did I get this one from? I don't know. <laughs> I pulled this from your bio for our conference. That's the old bio. How did I get that? I just <laughs> your folder. All right, <laughs> you've got to talk about what you're actually doing today. But I will say in a moment, Kate, Kayla is passionate about the value administrative professionals bring to organizations and fostering professional development opportunities for other administrative staff. So I know that in addition to continually investing time into her own professional development and growth, she actively mentors other admins and advocates for quality training for administrative professionals. And again, I know that for a fact. So will you take one moment and tell them what you currently do? And <laughs> I apologize. Uh, I still work with the same executive, uh, but I now work um, under uh, Midnight Sun Consulting. Uh, so I still do all the wonderful things I did for, for James as I, I've always done. And in addition to that, I've started to step into the admin training world because I have 20 plus years of knowledge and I want to share it with everyone and help catapult their careers and save save the time that it took me to learn it. Yeah, very good. All right, excellent. Um, so back to the guide. The funny thing is with our project, when 
we started talking. I was enlisting Kayla to write a 20 page ebook, downloadable ebook, 20 page. We ended up with a guide that's 118 pages because Kayla had so much to say when she told me she wanted to address uh, this toxic, and I use that word lightly, um, because there are, the misaligned, that happens so often. So this whole topic that she wanted to delve into, I was like, that's great. We have never addressed that. Office dynamics in 34 years, we've never really brought this out in the open, although we hear about it behind the scenes often. We all know that. And I bet many of you have administrative peers who talk to you about their challenges, right? So anyways, we ended up with this phenomenal, like it's it's packed, like you, you can definitely see, this is content rich. And so this is where we are. We're very proud. We just published this hot off the press. So let's, delve into it and then we can talk more um, about it but kayla let's start out i think it's really important for you to let attendees know why this topic why now why they need to take this seriously or be for, interested <laughs> for a couple reasons one because if you're in the workforce long enough admin or any position if you're in the workforce long enough, if you haven't come across it yet, you will, uh, whether it's a toxic manager or a misaligned manager. And if you're lucky, it won't be the manager you support directly. It'll just be one that you have to interact with. If you're unlucky, it'll be the one you have to support. Now, being able to tell the difference between a toxic manager and a misaligned manager sounds like it would be simple, but it's that's not always the case. And then for a lot of us, one of the things that COVID did that some of us didn't realize is we had misaligned managers and we might not have realized it at the time, but the work from home gave us a buffer uh, from having to deal with some of the, the, the issues of dealing with the toxic or a misaligned manager because we weren't physically around them. With more and more of us coming back into the office, whether it's hybrid or full time, we've lost that buffer. So these conversations are coming up more and more frequently in admin community, um, Facebook pages and LinkedIn groups and in webinar uh, questions. And just at Joan's conference uh, earlier this month, they were the conversations in the hall that people were having quietly because these are the, the things that we've always been taught that you don't really want to admit. We have this mindset that if we can't successfully support a leader, that it's our fault. And this is a mindset, uh, mind, I'm losing my words. Yeah, the, yeah shift. The uh, yeah, mindset, mindset shift that needs to happen. Um, and so I just think it's very timely. I think it's time that we take the stigma out of the conversation. There's nothing wrong with having these conversations about the mental health and the, the physical health that ties into working with this type of leader and how to handle it. And if you're not dealing with it yet or right now, being able to identify these type of managers and how to work with them will save you so much time and it will save your mental health in the long run because you already have the tools. Yeah. It's really good because I'm just thinking, um, again, uh, 34 years, like with off, well, one, as an assistant myself, right, and knowing that there were some misaligned opportunities, and that's why I did leave some jobs. But over 30, like 34 years with Office Dynamics, there's so many of those private conversations assistants will have with me when I'm conducting a workshop or doing training, especially when we were doing the in-person, because it was easy at break or lunch for them to pull me aside and let me know here's what's happening and what do I do and how do I do that? And there, you know, there was a lot of fear, like not only what Kayla said about fear that well, or the thought of, Hey, I'm a great admin. I shouldn't, you know, be a failure at any of this. I could do this. But the other one that I used to hear a lot 
people were afraid to leave their job. Like they felt like, where am I going to go to? Like I'm, I'm 50 years old and yeah, my boss abuses me verbally, but you know, I'm afraid. What am I going to do? Uh, or I live in a small town. There aren't many jobs. And so they just, they take it, they stay and they take it. And, you know, so I've heard hundreds of comments over the years from assistants. Um, and then a lot around the misalignment, right? Like you said, it isn't um, necessarily that you're a bad assistant or they're a bad executive. You're just not aligned for each other. Uh, so there is, and I want Kayla to talk, but you're like, as we're talking and I'm hearing you, it's bringing up so many scenarios that I can, you know, think of, and we can maybe dig into those. Right. So, and I love the fact that you how you're staying now we're back in the workplace and we have to face these things. We we're at a stage in our profession and careers where we should talk about this openly. And that's why we're doing this. And that's why you wrote your guide. Yes. It, it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's <laughs> like it's real and it happens. So it's helping each other. Um, so first of all, of course, we want to start with you identifying for everyone, the difference in <clears throat> toxic, how you define that, and then misaligned <laughs> managers. And so in this guide, we define a toxic manager as somebody who is manipulative. They are, uh, uh, what's the word? They use intimidation. They play favorites. They criticize publicly. They belittle you. They're intentional when they're they're causing um stress and harm in in that dynamic in that relation that the working relationship misaligned throughout the guide we go back and forth between misaligned and a bad fit and we do this intentionally because when we're talking about a misaligned manager um, we're not talking about that they're not good at being a manager they can be a great manager you can absolutely get along with them pers um, personally but their work styles, their values, their approach, their communication style and yours do not match. And you can both try really hard to make it work and it just doesn't. And that's a misaligned manager and or a bad fit for, for them and a bad fit for you. And sometimes it's a misaligned manager and there's just some work that needs to be done and then great. You guys will be on the road to a great relationship, great working relationship. Sometimes not so much, but there's a difference between the two. And the biggest difference is toxic is intentional. Misalignment is not. And the, the guy goes through it really detailed as to what the difference is, where the overlap is and um, how to tell the difference. Mm -hmm. Yes. You spent a lot of time early on in the guide about that, which I really like. And also, well, here, I'm just, I just turned to this page. Um, so you've got maybe really quick, can I, I'll do this under this little chart, we have um, toxic managers. These are the people who make work feel like a battlefield. They're not just having a rough day. They consistently engage in behaviors that harm the work environment and your well being. We're talking about manipulative tactics, Gaslighting, ooh, that's a good one. Public humiliation, creating a culture where everyone's walking on egg shells. Um, these actions are often driven by self-interest or a desire for control, and they can really mess with your head space, making you question your worth and draining your energy. I think that was really good. Um, and so that was most of what you had there. And then the bad fit, you said, now these managers aren't out to get you. They're just in over their heads. A bad fit manager isn't trying to cause harm, but their skills, personality, or values just don't align with what the job requires. This can show up as poor communication, bad decision making, an inability to inspire or manage effectively. Picture a manager who is great as a technical expert, but just doesn't have the people skills to lead a team. The result, missed opportunities, and efficiencies, and general sense of frustration, but not necessarily the fear or anxiety that comes with a toxic boss. 
So I hope that helps everyone. That, that's like a great snippet. I forgot we had that chart in there. So, um, well, let's get into uh, strategies because I think we're going to have a lot of questions and um, we would really like to hear, do I know the name of the guide? I'm sorry. <laughs> I just got so into the topic. So I am going to tell you the guide and you can only order this through Office Dynamics. We are the publishers. It's a rather long title, but the guide is Incompatible Leadership. It's a guide and a workbook. So there are some areas, a chapter in here where you can do your self-assessment and reflection activities. Um, and then, like I said, content rich. And then the subtitle is Strategies for Dealing with Toxic or misaligned managers. Again, you can only get this through us. We do not have this on Amazon yet. Maybe down the road, but this is uh, our baby and we're really proud of this and with Kayla. Um, and really quick, I'm gonna tell you the chapters because that might help you think of questions to ask Kayla. We are gonna go to strategies, but the chapters include bad fit versus toxic manager, recognizing toxicity and misalignment in managers. Then there's the self-assessment and reflection, um, mental health and physical health implications. Kayla gets into that a lot. And also Kayla, I think we didn't really mention you experienced this in your career. Yes. And it really led to health issues for you. And then there's coping strategies, a whole list, professional development and building allies and how to exit gracefully. And after leaving a toxic work environment, what do you do? So let's go to the strategies. Um, and I believe you have four you especially wanted to cover and also the, how to determine when it's time to move on. You know? Right. Yeah, so as much as I would love to go into all of them, that would be like an all day webinar. I did pick four and I'm going to uh, start with the, the self-assessment um, reflection and assessing the situation. Uh, once you learn what the, the signs are for a toxic manager and a misaligned manager, you learn what the differences are um, and how all of that can show up you need to do a self-assessment. You need to assess yourself and, and see where the, the relationship is currently uh, between you and your, your executive as far as, and the, the, the assessments are in the guidebook, but as far as where it currently is and how it's affecting you. And that's really important because emotions all play a part in uh, the assessment. Uh, the reflection allows you to really dig into how it's affecting you so that you can remove the emotion when you go to assess the situation as a whole. And it's really important to remove the emotion out of it so that you can assess it logically and uh, be able to make this decisive action or supportive action depending on which type of manager you're dealing with. And uh, in addition, the, the reflection activity can be an ongoing thing and the assessments can continue, you can continue to use them as situations change. And I think within that section, uh, cause there was so much, you have suggestions for them of different tools or how to uh, document or where to do the self-assessment. I think you also have some checklists in here I do. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we have so much. Um, so the assessments. Um, assessment. I was just trying to see. Um, we have an assessment for the toxic. Um, oh, you the gave the top. Top. Yeah. Environment and just kind of checklist of the, the different little categories. And then we have one for a misaligned manager. Mm -hmm. And then it says the additional steps of, of what to do. And then the next thing that we have you do is uh, reflection. And it's journaling prompts. And we list, I think, 30 different journaling prompts 
from different um, perspectives of different ways you can go about reflecting on the, the situation. Can you give them a couple of the examples of the journaling prompts? I'm looking, you know, just to give them an idea to think about what some of the prompts are. Yeah, so for job uh, satis uh, satisfaction journaling prompts, uh, you can uh, reflect on your role. What aspects of your job do you find most fulfilling? What aspects do you find least fulfilling? On value and recognition, do you feel valued and recognized for your contributions at work? Provide examples. Prompts about feelings around your job and work envi uh, environment. Daily reflections. How did you feel about work today? What specific events and interactions influenced your feelings? If you are feeling overwhelmed at work, you are really stressed out at work, and your mental health is, is being affected, I highly suggest using this one and daily. And, and this will really help you get to the core of, of something that's going on at work, in addition to the assessments and some of these other um, reflections. There's other strategies you would do on top of this, but this one is really good because you're taking the emotion in, that you felt that day and kind of just working through it. Um, and there's others about prompts for working relationships with your manager. Uh, feedback. Did you receive any feedback from your manager today? How did it make you feel? Communication. How effective was the communication with your manager today? Uh, were there any misunderstandings or positive exchanges? Uh, some of these will, you can go back and see where the improvements are if you're dealing with the misaligned manager. Maybe when you first start out, there's lots of misunderstandings and not very many positive communications but you work on some, use some of these strategies and you work on improving that misalignment and you start having less miscommunications and more positive interactions. And you can see where you started and where you come from. And that'll show you the, the positive momentum you have, which can be very encouraging when you're still dealing with some of that stress because you aren't quite there yet. Mm -hmm. I love, I love the prompts. Again, I was just honing in on the one about the relationship with the manager because that's so much of what the discussion's around. But when I read these, like conflict or harmony, do you experience any conflicts or harmonious moments with your manager today? Describe it. Uh, you talk about trust and autonomy. Do you feel trusted by your manager to do your job? Um, I don't know what that chirping is. Overall relationships. How do you feel about your overall? I love this one, manager support. How did your manager support you in achieving your task today, right? Because we're always thinking about how do we support them? But I guess as an assistant, if you're not getting support, you're not feeling nourished, your soul's not being fed, that affects us, right? And I know you, you've you been very fortunate with James the past several years. How many years have you worked with James now? Four. He's unbelievable. Like, yeah, he a phenomenal situation. And you've had bad situations in the yes, past. You know that difference. So um, I love the self-reflection. So, all right, the second, and we could go back, you know, to some of these points and, and share more with you if you want. Uh, but you had a number two about setting boundaries. That's huge, right? Yes. And so so this strategy is for dealing with both. And it, in the workbook, we have strategies for dealing with toxic, strategies for dealing with misalignment, and strategies for dealing with both because there is overlap between the two. And boundaries is one of those strategies that you should always set, even in a good relationship, you should ha have boundaries. And those boundaries actually help build that relationship. And when you have a misaligned manager, those boundaries really do help. And what boundaries do is they, they for you, set clear expectations of what you will and will not tolerate in the workplace. They also send a message to your leader and to yourself that your well-being matters. It also creates a space when you're in a hectic environment, especially in a toxic one, for uh, a place for you to breathe and think. And these boundaries can be as simple as in off hours, I'm not checking my emails. I'm not on call. 
Now, there are some roles where you, when you sign up, that's part of your, your thing, you are on call. But if, it, if it's not in your job description, don't open yourself up to it if that's not what you want to do. You get to decide those boundaries. And if you've already opened yourself up to that, have the conversation. Set those boundaries. When I interviewed with James, I told him that after hours, I'm off. I don't have my emails open. I don't have the notifications on. However, if there is an emergency, if there is something time sensitive, text me. I have no problem hopping on. But otherwise, regular stuff that can wait, I'm not touching. And he respects that boundary. Those are important. That helps my mental health. And he knows that that's, that's how I am. He knows that in an emergency, I have no problem helping out. But otherwise, I'm off when I'm off. So having those boundaries is super important. And it, it's one of those strategies that is harder to implement after the fact, but it is very, very doable. Oh, good point. There was, I just saw a quick, a great question from Francois. I wanna um, just quickly ask. Um, this is, I think, a great question. Would you say a misaligned manager could be convinced to do this workbook together as they have no evil intent? They, I think, think so. I think if you come to it um, openly and, and say, look, we want to work together. I, I want to be successful. You want to be successful. And we're both trying. In addition to this, I would actually, if, if you're supporting them, the Joan and James's book, The Executive Competitive Edge, because this, this book tells your executive how to leverage you and, and how to utilize you. I'm trying to look really yeah, quickly through because if it's about the misalignment to um, like how would I approach this book in terms of about just the mis more the misalignment and leading to like you said, really, you know, I want to be, I want us to have that great partnership and it's interesting. I mean, to me, I always say a good time to do this conversation is right after we've had this webinar to say I attended this webinar today and it was really interesting around possible possible misalignment between executives and assistants. And so when you look into that piece of it, um, because the other thing is if there is any kind of misalignment, you know, that those are what I call the hidden barriers. They prevent you from being more productive, a stronger team, being more effective, uh, really being able to do what you need to do as a team, right? So I think if you approach that, the conversation in that way, um, and then using some of these points in here that, oh, let's, let's discuss this piece. Maybe, maybe there's a little Maybe we're a little off in this piece, but here's advice. Here's what we could do. I, I like the idea of, um, I think it just has to be presented appropriately, right? So the leader's like, oh, this is some cool stuff and it could help us maybe have a stronger relationship. Yeah, and, and there's strategies in there about having those candid conversations with them. Uh, to Francois's point of using it with them, I think having it in hand and having him go through it first and going, yeah, okay. And highlighting some of the things that he sees oh. and, and going, okay. And then going to his, his leader and, and say, you know, we're, we're doing okay. I think there's some misalignment and this is a great resource. I, I attended this webinar. This is a, a resource I purchased and I, I, there's some strategies in here I want to try, but it, it really emphasizes that we have to work together. Yeah. And, and let's go through some of these strategies and, and maybe not the whole thing all at once, but show him a strategy and try that one and do one at a time because you don't want to overwhelm the executive with too many things at once, but doing one at a time and just kind of showing him the strategy. And then if he has interest in reading the whole thing, let him kind of work his way into it. But I think just giving him the whole guide and saying, let's go through this whole thing at once You'll have a little more pushback, but showing him the guide, saying you attended, that you want to improve the, the working relationship and say, I want to try this one. 
Let's see how this goes. And then working to the next one and, and going step by step. If you start small, and work your way, especially when you show them the whole big thing, you start small, you'll, you'll get less pushback. That's really good. Um, so let's keep going. I know there's questions coming in, which we'll say there are some really good ones. Let's, I know you have a third strategy. So out of your many strategies, you're focusing on the, the four. So your third one was about leveraging company resources. Yes, and I just saw a question on that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, leveraging company resources. We're talking about HR. We're talking about those employee assistance programs and the trainings and workshops that some companies offer. These offer uh, a structured support and they're designed to help you. Uh, if you have a toxic manager, I know it feels tricky going to HR, uh, but there, it, it's in the book in detail how to to do that, how to seek help, seek mediation, um, and how to address going to HR for a, a toxic manager. Uh, one of those things is the, the next thing I, I want to talk about, uh, which is documenting everything. Uh, but there, there's ways to to go about it. And one thing everybody will tell you if you want to go to HR is HR is there to protect the company. Yes, HR is there to protect the company. But in order to protect the company, they also have to protect your rights. So there, there is a fine line. If there's a toxic manager, chances are you're probably not the only one who's having problems with them. So if you address it the right way and you have the documents and the hard proof without the emotion in it, you're gonna have more success. And if you go in with an attitude of, I want things to improve, not I want this person fired, you're gonna have more success. There are some really tricky questions like around this HR thing. And um, like a part of me feels like we need it and we should have, also someday have an HR person on here because there's a lot of people, I seem to see a lot of assistants say, oh no, don't go to HR. And I could see, I understand if you have had the situation yourself, Yeah. but it is very serious if it's a toxic relationship. And yeah, maybe some of you work in companies where they're not going to have your back, but overall, like that is, a, what do you say about that, Kayla? Like, because then there's this fear and now like again this is a whole hr thing i actually have the perfect example in the guide oh what is it do you remember my it? toxic manager example was hr it oh. was the hr manager who was creating a toxic work environment she was trying to get me to quit and there's more details in there as to why and there were options that I didn't see until after the fact. I should have gone above her. I supported the CEO. I should have gone above her and I didn't. And so there are things that can take place. If, if HR is your issue, if HR is the one causing the, the toxic, go around them. They report to people too. But you have to dock out document everything. And you do have to go in order if you want it to work. You can't just skip steps. You have to do HR first. If HR isn't going to work, then go around. But have the document documentation, the emails where they're, they're being toxic, the uh, notes that you made after the interaction that you had with them verbally in their office. You have to document everything and we're just diving into the next one. Yeah, number four. <laughs> number four. Um, but with documenting uh, does it, it creates the foundation for one going to HR when their HR isn't the problem. It creates a clear factual record. It clarifies expectations when you're dealing with a misaligned manager. Um, sometimes a misaligned manager is somebody who's very set in their ways or um, have a problem admitting that they need to make any changes. Uh, and so sometimes you have to go to HR to mediate to get some of those, get them to work with you. Um, but it also helps get you organized. So there, you have to document everything, whether it's every relevant, so every relevant, I have a notes here, uh, every relevant interaction, decisions, 
feedback from your, your manager, emails, meeting notes, any red flag, document it. Even have your journal notes. If you, you're doing that daily journal note, uh, journal prompt, document that and stick it in there so that you can see, here's the facts, here's how I felt at the time. Now that I don't have all the emotions, can I look at this differently? Can I look at it from a different perspective, right? So document everything. HR is one of those tricky things and, and there is no right answer that'll fit everybody. You have to take it uh, step by step for you in your situation. When I was having the issue with HR, she was my toxic manager. 2020 yeah. vision, I should have gone around her, but I didn't. That's really good. Well, I'm looking at to some of the comments about, um, yeah, my executive, uh, Francois or Jordana, uh, write me up or fire me, you know, even if I uh, much blinked an eye or went to the union. So that that goes to then it's time to walk away. Like you've got to walk away. Like, let's talk about when to accept that you need to leave. And, you know, and then, of course, people are going to say, but I can't leave. I need the money. Where am I going to go? Like, talk about that. <laughs> yeah. So throughout the, the, the guide, it talks about the mental health implications um, and, the, and how even physical health implications will manifest when you're dealing with these high stress situations when you do it long term. And if you've done all the steps and the misaligned manager and you just your oil and water and things aren't going to get better for misaligned manager, things aren't getting better. That's not a failure on your part. It's not that you're not good enough. It's just that you're not a right fit for each other. I had one of those managers too. I wanted him to succeed. I wanted the company to succeed. And the best way I could do that for them was to help find the right fit admin for that CEO and step into another role within the organization or to find another role outside the organization. I found one within the organization, but it took me three years to have that, that shift in my, my, my mindset, which is far too long. And it, it took a toll on my mental health. However, with a toxic manager, there's coping strategies to get you through, but if the company isn't going to do anything about the toxic manager, which happens sometimes, unfortunately, you have to decide to own your own value and take ownership of your career and decide that your mental health, your physical health, your overall well-being and your future matter, have value and decide to leave. In an ideal world, you'd be able to quit and just look for work. That's not always the case. You have to have an action plan. You have to figure out your finances, what you can afford to do and can't afford to do. In the guide, there is a, a way to, it, it talks you how to create an action plan. What the, the different things you need to consider, including working while you look for work. Um, and then what to do once you find a new uh, work and how to recover from a toxic environment. And it's it's very important that you do your homework and do what's right for you. But whether you're 50 or 60 and need to look outside the organization, the one thing that's great about our career is the skill set, your ability tends to outweigh more in our industry than it does others. Um, so I'm just, you know, thinking again, too, from my perspective, um, as a, a, an outside training and coaching company, and I am hired by executives to come in and coach. I've coached over 300 executive and assistant teams over 34 years. And a lot of it is like around misaligned uh, expectations and the, the communication is a clear. And these are teams who have been worked together for years. That wasn't like they were new. 
Um, but that's where I'm brought in and I'm the middle person and I'm listening to both sides. And what I find is the executive is right, the assistant is right, but they don't match. My job as an outsider is to be the facilitator to bring those perspectives together and create alignment. So, I mean, a couple things, yeah, short of bringing me in, but what I wanted to say is when, especially the misalignment, because I think there's a lot of that because as an assistant, you don't always get to choose your boss. I mean, I remember when I was an assistant, maybe I had a wonderful executive and then they moved him to another area and they were going to bring someone else in. And it wasn't the same partnership, you know, or there are times that a lot of times executives are not given a choice about their assistant. They have to take the person assigned to them. So there is a lot of misalignment, I believe. Um, but the good news is developing like your communication skills. You know, these are all skills you can work on it. You can develop. Learn and you know, learning how to communicate, right? Kayla, how to communicate on the expectations. That's where your daily huddles come into play. You're working on that, bridging some of that misalignment or clarifying what I think you said as my executive. Was I really clear? So, you know, to me, there's some like tangibles we could tell them right now. Like you said, the building, you know, the, the boundary setting. Um, and let me tell you another really quick story and then we're going to go to questions but where i was brought in by a fortune 500 company that i had worked with many times and it was to work with a very high level executive in the legal department there were two executives and their ea who had been at the company for a long time was in that position a long time she was great but there were concerns that she really couldn't manage the job and so when I go on site, I'm there for two days. I sit at their workplace and I watch everything, every little thing. I dig into everything and I work with that person to help. And I work with the executive and the assistant. At the end of the story, she was not a good fit in that department. She could not keep up. It was not in her DNA which means executive perspective, her expectations weren't being met and she was stressed. So she was great. And what they did is they found another place for her within the company. And that's what we're talking about. It doesn't mean that they're a bad manager, you're a bad assistant. Sometimes it's a lot about, I mean, that's a whole other story, right? Because that's just who we are as people. Um, but let's go to questions. I want to I want to do that. So Malia, would you start um, sharing questions with us? And really quick, if anyone has to go off right now, you can get the guide for twenty four ninety five. We discounted it by five dollars for webinar attendees at OfficeDynamics.com. But I want to hear the questions, Malia. I bet we have some good ones. Oh no, where did Malia go? Sorry about that. Okay. I apologize. We had a little, I had a little faux pas on my side. Um, okay, Corinne, my boss often vents to me about non work related things. It's very exhausting. I'm new. She doesn't ask me ever about myself. She just tells me a lot about herself and her problems. I don't know what to do about it. That is one of those boundary setting things. If it's weighing on you and affecting your mental health, that's one of those candid conversations you have where you go to your, your executive and you set expectations for the role um, in where that personal line is for you. If she's got personal things going on, you can say, hey, you've got three minutes a day. You can't go on and on. I can't, I personally can't handle it. It affects my mental health and I need you to respect that. I also respect that you need to vent. So three minutes or five minutes, whatever it is, so that it's not ongoing all day long. Boundaries, it, it's mutual respect of each other's boundaries. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Francois wants to know what your stance towards mediating when experience, experiencing this, like, uh, do you go colleague or union, for example? I don't have experience with unions. However, uh, mediation is addressed in the, uh, the guide and it, it talks about uh, mediation internally with HR or mediation externally. Um, if your executive is open to mediation with uh, it, without HR and wants to do it internally, I would do it uh, with both another executive and another colleague that's equivalent to you. So you have both perspectives as a mediator. And that way there's no bias on either end. Or going to an external mediator, such as bringing somebody in like Joan or somebody else who can mediate completely unbiased on the situation. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see. Do you feel, Kelly wants to know, do you feel that these tips and strategies can be applied to coworkers as well as managers? Absolutely. Yeah, we did talk about that because the guide is, is focused on the executive assistant relationship. But when you read through this, it could be anyone. I mean, really any relationship, you know, in the workplace. So definitely. Yeah, there's one section in here and it, it, it talks about specific um, challenges that admins have for their leaders. If you take that section out, this could be for any employee and their manager. Take away the admin, any employee and their manager. But the strategies themselves will also work with any employee, any difficult employee that you have to deal with. So they're really universal strategies. Okay. Uh, Jennifer wants to know, how can you set boundaries without sounding too demanding or mean? Um, Unlearn that women are supposed to be polite and quiet and reserved um, and learn it is okay to be assertive but not aggressive. There's a, a fine line and go in with mutual respect. Talk about needs, their needs and your needs and find those boundaries. Where when I set my boundary about being off after certain hours, I explained the why for me, why I did that. And so James understood and respected that boundary. It wasn't just an arbitrary, I don't want to deal with work. I have reasons why I have those boundaries. And so he understands. If you're going to set boundaries, have those candid conversations. Now, I'm not talking about divulging personal information you're not comfortable sharing candid, open communication when you're setting boundaries. Okay. And I was going to say, too, if you go, to, I'm sure you will find a blog or several blogs on our website because we teach assertive communication. We teach how to be, um, you know, that fine line. And especially for women, it always seems to be a fine line that when we're assertive, we're considered something else. Um, so there is a way and you do have to learn the words to use and how to phrase things and how to say things. And I could be assertive with a big smile on my face if I wanted to right now. So I would just encourage you. I know we have articles, we have blogs, and probably if you go to our YouTube channel, there's over 300 videos. You'll probably find some on there to give you specifics in addition to what Kayla provided. Yes. Okay. Um, what happens when your manager is the CEO's executive assistant? Well, it still depends on if linemen are toxic. The steps are all the same. It ultimately comes down to the self-assessment, the reflection, and assessing the situation objectively, working through if, it, if it's toxic, the strategies, if it's misalignment, the strategies, and then reassessing the situation, and then taking 
ownership of your career one way or the other. And that's the hardest part. None of us want to hear that we need to leave. If your manager is the CEO's assistant and it's a misalignment and you guys are like oil and water and it's just not working, then you need to reassess and go, I'm good at what I do. This is not a failure. This is not the right fit for me. And it's not going to be the right fit for the organization either. And take ownership of your value. Value what you do. Value your growth and value your future. And either look for a role within the organization that you can move to or look outside the organization. Again, the guide goes through how to assess the situation, how to make an action plan on how to exit the company if that's what you have to do and how to do it gracefully and professionally because that is very, very important. And it, go, and then it explains why. But those are the, the things that we don't want to hear. We don't want to hear it leave when we're in those tough situations. Most of the time with misaligned managers, it can be fixed because a lot of the time when we're going, well, I've tried X, Y, and Z, and they're still not A, B, C. When you do that self-assessment and you reflect and you go back and look at it objectively, you might not have really done X, Y, and Z long enough. Maybe you haven't had the open communication as part of that and you needed to. So there is really deep strategies that you need to go into. You just made me think too about an assistant taking ownership. You know, it, we're talking about the managers so much, but I'm, I'm also want to say if there's misalignment, you also have to take ownership and initiate the conversations. Don't just sit there and expect it's going to go away. Like I'm thinking in our, like in STAR, we teach how to give upward feedback, 12 steps, right? So also as assistants, it's us taking the lead and the ownership and owning it. And the other piece I want to add, because I was just thinking again, this is in STAR. Like if you're going to go in and have a conversation, really the first thing is you have to be willing to accept the outcome. If you're not willing to accept an outcome, whichever way it goes, then don't even go in and talk. You know, and we always say, and Kayla, you just finished Star, is that, you know, when you approach and have the conversation, either they're going to be open and want to try your ideas and make the changes, or that I might say, well, Kayla, I like some of what you said, but I don't like this part. Or I'm going to say, no, Kayla, I'm not doing any of it. I'm not working on this, right? Those are the three answers you're going to get. So I speak to that for a moment, like us owning it as well as the assistance and being ready for those conversations. It's about being committed to the intention, not to the solution you want. So the intention is to improve the work environment you're in, to improve your career growth, your career trajectory. And there's lots of ways to do that. And sometimes it's not the way that we think it's going to go. I've had my career go off in directions that I didn't want at the time that turned out to be the best thing for me. And so be open to the answer you don't want. That might be the best thing for you. It's scary. It's change. We, as humans, don't like change. We don't like the unknown. And that can even be just a different role within the organization. That's change. That's unknown. And you might be surprised. People might be more open than you realize. We tell ourselves so much negative narrative about ourselves and how we think other people perceive us that we tend to not have the conversations that we should and a lot more can happen with that open conversation i like that i wrote that down be open to the answers you don't want 
That was very intelligent. That was very good. Um, also, like there was something you, uh, two things I'm just thinking that we talked about, um, the mind shift. You lightly talked about that early on, but can you really explain that, how you were saying you've got to do this mind shift thing? <laughs> yeah, as admins, we tend to be service oriented. We want to help other people succeed. And in order to do that, us helping other people succeed is how we rate our success. We help them succeed. They're successful. So we're doing good at our job. When we have a misalignment, I'm going to speak specifically to bad fit misalignment because this is, is where it's most prominent. When we're, we're with an, a manager that we're misaligned with and we've gone through all the steps and that manager has worked with us, they have also tried to mutually meet us halfway and you still just can't align, you butt heads, you just can't work well together. There's a mind shift going, well, if I just work harder, if I just try, if I just improve my skills, then I can do this because I've supported everybody else before this person. And it's not you, not in that sense. It's not because you're not good enough. It's not because you don't have the skill set. The styles are different. The communication is different. The expectations don't align. It's braver to take the step to walk away than it is to stay in a situation that you know is bad for you. And that is the best thing we can do for you. I sit in a job that was for three years that was affecting my mental health because I just needed to try harder because I had supported every difficult executive before him and I could do this one too. I wasn't going to fail, but I didn't fail. I, I succeeded more when I chose to help him succeed the right way with the right EA, doing what was right for him and what was right for me at the same time, which was to walk away from being his EA into something different. And that took more strength anything else. Walking away to do what's right for you is not a weakness. It is strength and it is brave. Wow. Excellent. I think that's a wonderful way to um, come to the end of our, our webinar before everyone heads off. Just a couple of closing things. Um, and one, I don't know, Kayla, if you want to stay on five more minutes and take questions. I don't know if you can, but I, can. I just want to do a few announce, announcements if people do have to go off. But one, thank you again for bringing this incredibly important topic to the surface and out in public because we need to talk about this and have these intimate conversations and support each other. So really quick, uh, again, just some announcements of what's coming up. So December 4th is our annual It's a Wrap webinar. So that will be the last one of this year for 2024. So please sign up. It's a great time. We recrap the whole year, go through the best strategies we've heard. Plus we have fun and get in the holiday spirit and give a lot of gifts away. And it also starts our 12 deals of Christmas. Um, 2025 is going to be an amazing year. It is our 35th year anniversary. So we have a lot of things in the works to help support you as we move forward. So check your inboxes. And again, one more time, if you want to get this guide, it's incredible. Or maybe you know a colleague who needs this and they're afraid to kind of speak up or ask for help. So again, there's a special pricing on this right now. So take advantage of that. Um, again, Kayla, really, this was awesome. And there were so many great comments and people are very grateful you brought this to us today. Uh, so anyways, we got maybe two more minutes. Does anyone else have a question? Or Malia, is there another question or two? And then we'll wrap there up. There is. Um, okay. So 
how would you handle a supervisor who vents to a team that they want things handled in a certain way and which then sets the tone in how you work with your internal teams. However, when your internal team complains about your working style and or goes around you to the manager directly, the manager doesn't speak up and have your back. They instead leave you hanging, looking like you're causing issues uh, with your team and um, when you were only doing what you were told to do. I, again, that's that's addressed in the, the guide. It's, again, uh, candid conversations. It's asking for feedback, and it's asking for specific feedback. It is documenting what those conversations are and what you're told. It is, um, there's, there's a lot of pieces to it. So the guide has all these different strategies and you stack them really. It, it's not just one that you'll do. So if your executive told you just you to, to, to work this way, but not the whole team, then there's an issue. He, he's setting you up for failure and you need to find out whether that's intentional or unintentional. If it's unintentional, you, that candid conversation can help bridge that gap. If it's intentional, then you need to start working through the, the strategies for a toxic manager. If you told the whole team this and you're the only one following it, then you need to have that kind of conversation with your executive about um, accountability and enforcing it across the whole team so that it, it, it works. Otherwise, there's going to be continued issues. Either way, you need to have these conversations. You can't just let it happen. The candid conversations help. The um, documentation is important, no matter what you're what you're doing. If you're having issues, documentation again, the self assessment, the reflection. Make sure that when you're looking at these things, you're looking at them objectively, and not just through the frustration it's currently causing. Frustration is valid, but you need when you're looking at these the situation, it has to be objectively. That's a really good question and that's a tough one, right? Where, you know, your executive is saying, this is how I want you to handle the team and then you go do that and then and then the team comes back and, and you're not supported in that. Um, and so too, I think that becomes one of those courageous conversations with your executive around, you know, there seems to be different perceptions or expectations here. This is what you're expecting of me to do and how to communicate with the team, but the team is not, you know, abiding by that. And so, you know, I need to know, do you have my back or don't you? You know, and we just had, actually, we just had this conversation a year ago in August, I was on a coaching. Now the good news was the CEO was willing definitely to have the assistance back. He just didn't know what his team was doing in not responding. So we had to also have that conversation. By the way, look, this is what the EA is asking of your team and this is they're brushing her off. Well, once that's the other thing, is your executive aware, like you said, Kayla, um, because they may not be aware and then they do need to go say something. So again, it, it ties back to the courageous conversations to really clearing the air through verbal communication, not written or texting or emailing. All right, I guess we have to let everyone go. Those of you who are still on, I'm really happy because obviously you are the ones who have a high interest in this very important topic. So Kayla and I thank you for coming today and we hope to see you definitely at our December webinar. Kayla, again, thank you so very much. If people want to connect with you, how do they connect with you personally on LinkedIn or? Yes, on LinkedIn. Um, didn't make a slide for, for my, my QR code. I know, I just saw it a bit though, but what if they want to stay in touch with you? Yeah, if you search for me on, on LinkedIn, I'm, I'm there. Um, you'll see that I, I have shared connections with Office Dynamics and Joan and uh, you should be able to find me pretty easy. Uh, yes. All right. Great. Well, thank you all so much. Take care and uh, happy Halloween too. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Bye. Kayla. Bye.